Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Saudi Press says U.S. blew up the World Trade Center. We've got that story, plus adding educational injury to chemical injury for the kids of Detroit. But first, the FBI is trying to keep their secret biometrics database a secret. RT is reporting the FBI wants to prevent information about its creepy biometric database, which contains fingerprint, face, iris, and voice scans of millions of Americans from getting out to the public. The Department of Justice has come up with a proposal to exempt the biometric database from public disclosure. It states that the Next Generation Identification System, NGI, should not be subject to the Privacy Act, which requires federal agencies to give people access to records that have been collected concerning them, allowing them to verify and correct if needed. The proposal states that allowing individuals to view their own records or even an account of those records could compromise criminal investigations and, say it with me, national security efforts. The FBI claims the retained data could also be used for establishing patterns of activity. And what does that sound like, James? That's that sort of minority report sort of pre-crime way. So it has other bad details, which you can read all about on the Federal Register, which is the way we learned about this proposal. And it is open for public comment until June 6th. And there's a little button for it on federalregister.gov. And there are 10 whole people that have put forth a comment, James. I think the first place I maybe heard this story was called The Trial. James? Excellent literary reference there, because that's, yeah, that's about what this is. It's uh, some sort of accusation that you don't know about by someone that you've never met, based on evidence you've never seen, that puts you in some sort of judicial process that you can't describe. That's basically what this is. And here's the secret evidence part of it anyway, which is this secret database that you're not even allowed to know anything about. Uh, You're not even supposed to know it exists, but they kind of have to put slip that into the federal register. So um, yeah, absolutely. This is the quintessence of the Kafkaesque. And there's so many different things to talk about when it comes to these databases. And we've talked about them to some extent before. We've talked about the DNA databases and uh, we've talked about uh, the blood blood collected at birth, (coughs) entered into secret military databases, and things like that. I'll throw some links in the show notes so that you can see some of our reporting on this in the past. But here's another aspect to this that really just struck me as I was reading this for the first time today, is that what about the idea that this these databases are always i mean there's always hacks going on there's always people stealing information from various sources do do, do w- even assuming it was angels in the FBI running this type of database would you assume that they have 100% perfect security and this information will never get out and what in the future will uh, crafty hackers be able to do with your you know, all of your information, including your DNA. I mean, that's that's a, another creepy aspect of this. When they collect and centralize this and put it behind lock and key, I mean, how safe is it anyway, even if you did trust the government to, to be, you know, good stewards of this? So there's so many different aspects to this, and it's garbage. Why doesn't a John Oliver or someone like this do one of those shows where they expose this and get a million people to flood the comment section of, of this, right? you know, rather than some silly political issue? Well, I, that's a great idea. Let's actually have people submit this to John Oliver, whether I don't know which way, if he tre- checks the, the tweets or the Fed book or which best way. But that's a that's a great actual solutions oriented thing that we can actually do. And in a lot of ways, yeah, James, it's just sort of waiting until this kind of stuff gets hacked and leaked. And we see the stories constantly. And these are where I think probably screenwriters and storytellers look deeply into the news and find these kind of stories and craft what we then go to the movies later and see as some fantastical thing about, you know, some kind of identity theft, you know, partial enemy of the state kind of charade. James, our second story this week, we go to Detroit as bogus tutoring programs stole $1.275 million from Detroit students. This comes via M Live. While Detroit public schools are hundreds of millions of dollars in debt and its teachers worry about poor conditions and whether they'll even get their next paycheck, more cases of alleged corruption being exposed. The latest indictment results from an FBI Detroit Area Corruption Task Force investigation that began well over two years ago. U.S. Attorney Barbara L. McQuaid's office claims that 
Carolyn Starkey Darden, the former Detroit Public Schools Director of Grant Development, left the district after nearly 40 years in 2005, at time which the 69-year-old created multiple after-school and tutoring entities that billed and were paid at least $1.275 million fraudulently for services never administered to students. James, I, I may have said this before, and in a lot of ways, I guess I look at it as the microcosm, but I worry that the sort of open and public destruction of Detroit that we've sort of been watching on our newspapers, as it has actually broken, and we can see all the things going on with the Detroit water crisis and people literally turning up dead associated with it, that how many other cities and towns have this within it? And I think that sort of gets to the question, James, that I don't know that we have an answer to, but sort of what was what was it that destroyed Detroit? I think we have to look at Detroit as a symptom of the nexus between corporations and government. And of course, in this case, it's the GM and the, the car manufacturers. And that was perfectly represented in the 1950s when there was a confluence of interests between the corporations, the government, and and the, the the working class. Because oh, you know, it was it was perfect. We could centralize all this production and manufacturing in this city, and you had the peak population of Detroit in the 1950s hitting 1.8 million, which is obviously way too much for a city like that. And of course, by now it's uh, dwindled down to 700,000 or so. And so uh, we've seen the development of that relationship, and uh, it was perhaps exemplified by Charles Wilson, the former CEO of GM, the man who came up with what's good for GM is good for the country, who Eisenhower appointed as Secretary of Defense, who oversaw the process of creating the interstate highway system, which actually benefited GM as well, interestingly. So that's, that's that ne nexus of influence. But at a certain point, it benefited the corporations more to offshore most of that manufacture and productive labor. And uh, so we've seen the disbursement and disbandment of that. And of course, who gets screwed in all of this? It's the average worker who, uh, you know, was built up and destroyed by the same corporate government nexus. So, I mean, I guess the question is, what do you do about this destruction that's going on? And it's, well, it's not going to come from the corporate government nexus, which has left these workers out to dry. Although... Breaking, hot off the press, uh, Detroit, fresh out of bankruptcy, discovers a $195 million pension shortfall. Shortfall. <laughs> so it's even worse than we thought. Um, what is the solution to this? Well, again, as I say, it's not going to come from the corporations. One, I mean, there are some interesting ideas popping up in Detroit. Um, I think precisely because people are starting to realize that the, the uh, public sector has failed them. And that's uh, exemplified in things like the Detroit Threat Management Center by Commander Dale Brown. I'll throw in an interview he did on a podcast uh, recently. It's a voluntary uh, private organization that provides community policing services and has had some remarkable results. Um, it's, it's an extremely interesting idea. And those are the types of ideas that are becoming possible because people are realizing the government, the corporations, they're not there to help you. They're there to screw you, use you abandon you when they need to. So, uh, you know, I mean, there is an upside to this, I guess, in that necessity is the mother of invention. So not to give any disrespect to all those injured in Detroit, that in some ways, maybe they're actually going to be better off than all the other cities because their collapse has already been sort of accelerated and they're already setting up the alternatives as opposed to the other cities that have still yet to collapse and won't really have any idea what to do. Yeah. Yeah. People who are living in the bubble um, tend not to prepare for what's coming after the bubble. All right. Well, it gets worse on episode 270 of New World next week as we move to our third and final story, James. It is a triple. And I found that I've kind of been adding in these 9-11 plus 15 stories again as the anniversary approaches. So the first story, and we've hinted at this, and you know these stories have been building for months and months, so in a way, it's a little bit of a little update basket for you. Saudi press says U.S. blew up the World Trade Center to create war on terror. The Saudi press, still furious over the U.S. Senate's unanimous vote approving a bill that allows the families of 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia. This time, the London-based Al Hyatt Daily has claimed that the U.S. planned the attacks on the World Trade Center in order to create a global war on terror, saying, quote, September 11, 
is one of winning cards in the American archives because all the wise people in the world who are experts on American policy and who analyze the images and the videos of 9-11 agree unanimously that what happened in the Twin Towers was a purely American action planned and carried out within the U.S. Proof of this is the sequence of continuous explosions that dramatically ripped through both buildings. Expert structural engineers demolished them with explosives while the planes crashing into them only gave the green light for the detonation. They were not the reason for the collapse, but the U.S. still spreads blame in all directions, end quote, and it goes on. So, James, this is what we talked about, the possible pushback and blowback when these things move forward. And we've seen a lot of behind the scenes moves going on with Saudi Arabia. So, again, you don't in all situations, don't so much listen to the yap yap. you got to actually look at what they do. But Chucky Schumer, we learn, had already put the poison pill in that bill anyway. As the New York Post reported just before that vote, Senator Charles Schumer and other proponents of the Justice Against Sponsors of American Terror of Terrorism Act. Oh, whoops, I misspoke. <laughs> Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, JASTA stuffed an amendment into the final draft allowing the Attorney General and Secretary of State to stop any litigation against the Saudis in its tracks. And for the hat trick, James, as you tweeted, U.S. government secretly destroyed evidence in trial of accused 9-11 masterminds, as Activist Post reports on May 11th. Defense lawyers for the accused mastermind of the 9-11 terror attacks asked for Judge Colonel James Pohl and the prosecution team to be recused from the trial and for the case to be shut down. Defense lawyers David Nevin and Major Derek Poteet say that the U.S. government destroyed evidence related to the case, according to the New York Times. The two men are unable to provide further details because the issue is classified, but Mr. Nevin said the evidence was favorable to the defendants. And those defendants are, of course, the vaunted KSM. So, pretty bleak stuff, James. Unfortunately so, and... Speaking of the trial, here's another uh, perfect example of that. Again, we can't even know what evidence they illegally destroyed in this trial because, well, you know, that would reveal too much about something that happened 15 years ago. They can't reveal what evidence they even had that they illegally destroyed in this show trial that they're putting on, which pretty much sums up the ridiculous nature of the kangaroo court they're trying to set up here and have failed to do in the past 10 years plus that they've had this guy in custody. It's amazing. It's incredible that they still haven't even managed to put on the show trial that we know they're all still trying to put on. But keep in mind, this is the same KSM who confessed 9-11 A to Z and everything else, from including assassinating the, uh, the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny and the Plaza Bank in Washington that uh, wasn't even... It didn't even exist when he was captured, So, but he was plotting against it, according to this confession, which was extracted through torture, including 183 bouts of waterboarding, keeping him awake for seven and a half days at a time, making him stand for hours at a time, and, oh yeah, capturing his children and telling him that they were going to torture his children if he didn't confess to these things. Do you think that might have motivated him to make a false confession? Maybe? Oh, I guess we'll never know, because, of course, the CIA also illegally destroyed all all of the torture testimony uh, that, uh, that they had. So we'll never really know what ultimately happened there, and that's the whole point of it, and no one will ever go to jail for that. The Saudis, on their part, now bringing out the 9-11 inside job accusation, yay, but not really yay, because ultimately this is treated in the exact same way as when Ahmadinejad said the same thing in front of the UN. It's this ridiculous, how could he say this type of thing? And it just plays into the propaganda narrative. Look, all these crazy enemies are saying this about us. Um, and this is, I think, the perfect example of what we've been talking about here. 9-11 is now this just political football that we can use to demonize Saudi, Saudi Arabia when we need to. And we can flip that switch and they can let a lawsuit go ahead or they can stop one, thanks to Chucky e. Schumer and that amendment that you talked about in the JASTA um, legislation. So it's all just politics. The real base of the issue, as we know, all of this time is the Saudis didn't uh, didn't uh, coordinate the, the the terror drills that were going on that day. The Saudis didn't wire WTC seven for destruction. The Saudis didn't uh, coordinate all of this uh, themselves. There was inside help. There was help from in intelligence agencies all over. That's the ultimate goal of this, and we can't lose sight of that because of these political football issues that are coming up now. Well, and to even 
quote, immortal technique, which would be a comment back to the Detroit story. Bin Laden didn't blow up the projects. James, I think this story with the Saudis and 9-11 approaching the anniversary is probably going to play into a bunch of the emotional con game 2016 presidential selection kind of fodder. So this is what we're going to see them all get to sort of bluster about as they can sort of prance around on the stage. James, uh, having said that, I guess uh, good news. I do a weekly spinoff from this, James. Call it good news next week. And on the most recent episode, I talk about Colorado's marijuana millions. We talk about Iceland's pirate party and that asteroids probably will not kill us. Meanwhile, some of the New World Next Week headlines we are watching, and there are far too many, again, to go over on this episode. There's actually a staggering amount of headlines using hashtag New World Next Week, but some of the stories we follow week in, week out. Google's French headquarters raided by French tax investigators. Head of National Obesity Forum calls low-fat foods the biggest mistake in modern medical history. And Elijah Wood clarifies... He does not have firsthand knowledge of Hollywood child abuse. And James, everything is awesome. Maximum euphoria in the stock market. We know everything is good and can never go bad again. I do actually have one other bit of good news and a bit of a deprogramming note. I'm happy to announce that my daily morning show, The Morning Monarchy, is now featured on the Truth Seeker app. So that's another great way to hopefully spread this information. Let me see. My list of existential worries here. Uh, asteroids? Okay, crossing that one off. All yeah, right, yes. Some good news. Okay. <laughs> up in the atmosphere. Yes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, a little bit of levity at the end. Okay, thank you again for these stories, James. Let's do it again next week. Appreciate it, man. Take care.